Goodness in prayer. Thank you to our music team for leading us in song. What a blessing it is each week. We have such gifted musicians in our church who uh, God uses to let our heart come alive and worship Him through music. I want to invite you guys to go ahead and take your copy of God's Word and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Our, our plan is to finish Genesis chapter 1 this morning. All right, we'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, but before we jump into that, let's briefly review where we've been so far. Uh, we started in the first two verses. The first two verses sort of serve as a summary statement of the story that is about to unfold. Uh, we are told in verse 1 that before there was a beginning, there was God. God was, and that God is the one who made everything. He created the heavens and the earth. And then we get this glimpse in verse 2 of what the earth is like. It was, you remember the t Hebrew term, uh, tohu wabohu. It was without form and void. It was, it was formless. It was empty. So these days of creation would solve the problem presented in verse 2. Uh, days 1 through 3 of creation would form the earth, and days 4 through 6 would fill the earth. Um, let's review what's happened in the days so far. Day 1, God created light. God said that there be light, and it was so. And God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. In day 2, God creates an expanse. That's our sky, our atmosphere, and he calls it the heavens. In day three, he creates the land and the seas and vegetation which sprouts on the land here on earth. And then begins the filling part of creation. So this now formed earth is filled. And in day four, he fills the heavens with the sun and the moon and the star, these wonderful, glorious heavenly bodies. In day five, he creates the first living creatures. You remember the Hebrew term nefesh, that which breathes, right? And so he fills the seas with all kinds of uh, sea creatures and fish, and he fills the sky with birds, thousands and thousands of birds. And finally, on day six, God creates land creatures. He creates land animals and, of course, mankind. And, of course, last week we stopped in verse 25, short of the creation of mankind, and that's where we'll pick up today. Now, you'll remember we have said that this is a story primarily about God. We don't want to lose sight of that. He is the hero of this story, and he has been the focus of this story. We've been learning about God. Who is this God that we worship every Sunday? Well, we've learned from Genesis 1 that he is an eternal God. That with, he is without beginning and he is without end. He is self-sufficient. He is self-existent. God doesn't need creation and yet he's not just an eternal God. He's a creator God. He made all things. All that is is because God made it. And he's a power for God. How did he make it? Remember? He spoke. Let there be, and it was, right? He, he's displayed his power in the making of all things with just his spoken word. And then we noticed that he's a good God, right? After every day of creation, we had that common refrain, and God saw that it was good. And we drew the right conclusion, right, that, that everything he made was good because he's good. It's good because the source is good. Our God is not just powerful, he's good. And by the way, unless those two work together side by side, God is all powerful and all good, we have no hope. But because he is all powerful and he is all good, oh, what hope we have. Last week, we meditated on the idea that God is a perfect designer. And so, Day four, he created these grand heavenly bodies in the sky, but they had a purpose and they had a place. They were subordinate to him, and yet they fulfilled his will of serving this earth. And he is glorified in the way that he designed the, the animals, the, the fish, the birds of the air, the land animals. And they all, we remember, said, we said that they all have parameters to them. God didn't just wind them up and let them go to be whatever they wanted to be. He made them according to their kind, and that was significant. But today, we're going to see the crescendo of his creation, uh, the exclamation point on this story, the climactic mark in this piece of art called creation, the creation of man. So let's read it together, verse 26 through the end of the chapter. It begins like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, 
after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. And you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Genesis chapter 1. Oh, what a glorious privilege it has been to sit here for a little while. I pray as we round out this chapter this morning that you would speak and that your name would be honored and glorified. God, please don't let me say anything that's not true. Please, Lord Jesus, if I do strike it from the ears of those who hear it, God, I pray that people will hear from you, not me this morning. God, I love you. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've had the privilege uh, over the years to coach some of my kids' teams. Most recently, I've been able for the last few years to be a volunteer uh, coach with the best wrestling club in the state, the Headhunters Wrestling Club, right? And because it's the best club in the state, people come there from all around the state to to get in our room and to be on our team. And, And they come in there a lot of times not knowing the people in the room, the coaches in the room, and the relationships and the dynamics in the room. And I can remember one time this kid named Christian came into the room and uh, he had been coming around for two or three weeks and periodically he would get paired up with my son Tyler and they'd be wrestling and and one night in in a break he's he starts doing the tennis look at me and Tyler you know what I mean the tennis look like me Tyler me Tyler me Tyler and then he goes very astutely you know you two look a lot alike (laughs) And we laughed about that. I mean, obviously we look alike, but he didn't have that information. He didn't know that I was Tyler's dad. But even though he didn't have that information, he could see really clearly that there was a reflection of me in Tyler. And as we come to our text today, we're going to see a similar theme, a a mysterious, mind-blowing theme that in creation of man, we're, we're going to note there's a unique reflection of God in us. And that is a truth, dear friends, got to be honest, that if we sit and think about for any amount of time, it will create in us joy. It will create in us uh, the sense of purpose and dignity. It will make you want to live with this God and for this God for the whole of your lives and for eternity. So our main idea today is simple. It is that God created man to vividly reflect his image in this earth. And we're going to just talk about that. When we get to verse 26 in this chapter, the creation narrative continues, of course, but the tone and the pace changes. You'll note it slows down here. And that's to cue us as readers that what is about to happen is significant. And I want you to hear this morning, dear friends, you are significant. You are significant. So let's look at it. Here, the first let's note the divine pronouncement of the creation of man. The divine pronouncement. There's a distinct difference in language when we get to verse 26. Up until this point, how has creation happened? We've already said this, but uh, it's happened. The power of God has flowed from this repeated phrase that God says. And God said, let there be, and there was. God said, let there be, and it was so. But in verse 26, we kind of get a break from that pattern, and we find this pronouncement being proclaimed. God sort of pauses and he makes this announcement. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. All of creation, all of creation is a declaration of the glory of God, no doubt about it, but the creation of man would be altogether different 
Because this would be intimately tied to the very nature of God himself. The text takes great care, I believe, to point that out. This is the clang of the cymbal in the symphony of creation. To draw our attention here. Behold, pay attention. What is about to happen is going to be the crown jewel of all that I have made. Genesis is a story about God first and foremost. But it's a story about God in relation to man. And the rest of this story, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is going to tell us the purpose of this relationship, the problem that is created in this relationship, and the redemption and restoration of this relationship, as we'll see in the book of Revelation. But most of you probably noticed, when we got to verse 26, that the language changed. We went from singular to plural, right? You see that? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. What on earth is going on here? Why is this one God, the God of all creation, now being referred to in the plural? Well, like most things in Genesis chapter 1, there's lots of opinions why that happened. Now, some believe that God here is actually talking to the angels. Hey, let us make man in our image, guys. Well, that's... That's not going to hold water, right? First of all, that's not true because there's no biblical evidence of angels being involved as agents of creation. And more clearly than that, man is not created in the likeness of God and in like the likeness of the angels. Verse five, or chapter 5, verse 1 tells us, When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God and God alone. So that doesn't work. Some have said that what is going on here is a... Uh, The use of the plural of majesty. Uh, Maybe you're unfamiliar with that term. I was until I was studying this here. It's the use of a plural pronoun to describe the honor of a single person, namely a royal person. All right, so maybe a um, famous example, you might have heard this one, is uh, Queen Victoria is known to have said after hearing a distasteful joke saying, we are not amused. All right, we was her. She was not amused, but she was using the plural pronoun because she was the queen. It's it's a reference of honor and majesty, and certainly I can see why this might be a valid interpretation of that, that we have honor and majesty happening here, and yet we have to agree there's so much more here than just that, right? That could have been used all throughout every declaration. There's honor and majesty in every stroke of creation, and yet it's only now employed. Why? I think because man is a reflection of God in this world, and so the text intentionally pulls the curtain back just for a second to show us a little bit more about this God in whose image we are made. This God is a God in community. This God is one God in three persons. That wonderful, mysterious, mind-blowing doctrine we call the Trinity. Now, to be fair, I don't think the original readers would have picked up on that. Uh, The doctrine of the Trinity was somewhat veiled all throughout the Old Testament. It's really not until the New Testament that we kind of have that veil toward back and we can see, right? But once we get to the New Testament, it becomes also clear, doesn't it? Because we are introduced... Most vividly to the second person of the triune uh, uh, Godhead. The Son incarnate, Jesus Christ, who is described in a myriad of different passages as being fully God. John uh, tells us in John chapter 1, not only that he was God, but that he was the one who created, right? John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He was there, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning. And all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we learn later that the word became flesh. No doubt this is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the word, and he made all things. So we're introduced to the second person of the triune Godhead. And then when we get to Acts chapter 2, we're introduced most fully and vividly to, it's not the only place of course, but to the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit, who is poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost and floods the lives of his disciples and, and guides us and teaches us and comforts us and acts now as the seal of our inheritance, Ephesians chapter 1. Now, the Israelites would not have picked up on that, but we can. We have the benefit of having the New Testament, amen? It's kind of like when you've watched a movie two, three, four times, like you start picking up on things throughout the movie that you wouldn't, But you do now because you know the end, right? Well, that's what's going on here. 
We see before us the doctrine of the Trinity right there in this divine pronouncement. And it is a beautiful doctrine. I think sometimes people are like, I don't understand why the Trinity is that important. Well, it's really important. And we will see that man in a moment is created to be in community. We'll see this uh, in a couple of weeks when we get to chapter 2. What does God say of Adam? It's not good that man be alone. Why? Because the God, he is created in the image of a God who is in community. A triune God. Well, we understand, by the way, this is really important. We understand the eternal love of God most vividly in the doctrine of the Trinity. Some wrongly propose that the love of God only came onto the scene when he created, when he created man. He needed something to love, and so he had to create because he needed to express his love, but that would be a deficiency in the fullness of God. And friends, God lacks nothing. Most notably, he lacked nothing when it comes to his love. You ever ask this question? This will make your mind hurt a little bit. What was God doing before creation? In eternity past, what was he doing? Well, we could speculate a lot of things, but Jesus tells us one thing, and we ought to sit in this. John chapter 17, Jesus says this. He's praying. He says, Father, I desire that they also, he's talking about his disciples, whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because, listen to this, you loved me before the foundation of the world. What's one thing we know that was happening that God was doing before creation God was eternally loving. God the Father was eternally loving the Son. That's the identity of our maker. The eternal Father loving and delighting in the eternal Son. So we understand the love of God when we look at the Trinity. Michael Reeves writes in his amazing little book, and I commend this read to you, Delighting in the Trinity. He says, indeed, the triune God is the love behind all love, the life behind all life, the music behind all music, the beauty behind all beauty, and the joy behind all joy. So let us not, church, move too quickly past that pronoun, right? It's important, indeed, not just so that we can rightly answer question three on the New City Catechism, how many persons are in God, but so that we might understand the love of God. We might understand This God in whose image that we are created. That's his identity. So we have this divine pronouncement. Notice secondly, now as we turn our eyes to that creation, the divine pattern of the creation of man. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and... uh, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that it creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. There's a pattern by which man comes to be. And let's note this pattern. And the first thing I want us to note should be the easiest observation. And it's a re- reiterating a refrain we've seen again and again in chapter 1. Man is created. Man is created. We won't camp here long, but it's really important. We've made this argument. The created is always subordinate to the creator. The maker is not only greater than, but he has authority over that which he has made. Which means, dear friends, that we, as created beings, are under the authority of Almighty God. We are accountable to him. Man is not God. We're created beings. And this is the very issue behind the first sin in chapter 3. We'll get there really shortly, right? Um, The temptation was in part to be like God. Now, that's an ironic temptation since they were like God, as we'll see today, right? And yet, the heart of it was to not be like God, but to be God, to set ourselves up as God. And that's what broke the whole world. And it's at the heart of our sin struggles now. It's at the heart of your sin struggles. We struggle, don't we, friends? Not to set ourselves up as God or to lift up other human beings as if they are God. That's called idolatry. But we can resolve it in measure, in some measure, by reminding ourselves that we're created. It's good to know your place. You're created. It's not about me and it's not about you. I'm not God, neither are you. Now, that's a feature that we share with everything here in chapter 1. But what makes us distinct, dear friends? 
Well, we get more information. We're not just created, but we're created in the image of God. Now, the word image there, selem in the Hebrew, it means likeness or statue. It has this idea of carving or shaping and forming. We've got two words in the Hebrew. They are two different words, image and likeness. But the two words don't bring different aspects. They're synonyms to basically bring home the, the weight of this truth that we bear the very image of our God. So three questions that I want to ponder on this truth for the rest of our time together. Three questions. Number one. Why did God create image bearers? Why? Number two, what makes us image bearers? And three, we'll do this in the conclusion, what are the implications of being an image bearer? So first of all, why did God make image bearers? Why did he do this? Well, to understand that, I think we need to understand, first of all, what creation biblically is understood to be. And many theologians have, I think, very correctly understood the uh, earth and all of creation to be sort of a divine cosmic temple, right? Psalm 78 declares this, that he built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth which he has founded forever. And the psalmist declares that that sanctuary of God, the tabernacle, the temple was patterned after the heavens and the earth, which is God's forever founded temple. And we won't go into too much detail here, but there's a lot that could be said about the tabernacle that Moses set up via the instructions of God in the wilderness. It was patterned to reflect the creation account. So verse 2 in Genesis 1, what do we have? We have the Spirit of God hovering over the formless earth, ready to breathe life. And, And before the construction of the tabernacle, what happens? The Spirit of God fills two men, Bezalel and Aholiab, to fashion the tabernacle. And Moses, after the completion of the tabernacle, blessed it. And set it apart as holy, which is exactly what God is going to do in day seven here of creation. The tabernacle itself was constructed to look like the canopy of the heavens. It was to reflect the world, the place of God's resting place. This this is all kind of telling us that this world was God's cosmic temple. So back to why did God create image bearers? Well, because that's exactly what kings do in their palaces. They set up images of themselves, not just in their palace or their, key, uh, in their temple, uh, but all throughout their territory to signal, this is my domain. I rule here. And so in the same way, the ultimate king of kings creates this cosmic temple called the world, and he places within it wonderful image bearers, but not lifeless statues, living creatures, because he's the living God. And there he sets us, mankind, to display his rule and his reign, even as he gives us rule and reign on this earth. God made us to image his sovereign rule over this creation. We are, friends, the visible representation of God on earth. That's wild, isn't it, to think about? Now, that's the why. What about us is image bearing? That's a good question to ask, a good thing to meditate on. And like lots of things in chapter 1, there's lots of different ways we can answer this question. Uh, we'll throw out one idea as one I don't think we should, we should hold. All right, It doesn't mean that we look like God or God looks like us. Okay, All throughout creation, we've been sort of drawing these and creating these statues of the Superman, right? As like gods, right? That's not what it looks like. God is spirit. He doesn't have a body, even though mysteriously and scandalously he condescended in bodily form in his son. It's not that God is this perfect human. But, but what does it mean? I think we can see it in two broad categories. Number one, we can see this image bearing in our nature and in our function. Right? Something that's built in our structure and something that we're called to do. All right? So first of all, our nature. Oh, we, we see this in a, ser- several different ways. Number one, we're not eternal because we had a beginning. We didn't exist eternally in the past, but we reflect the eternality of God because unlike rest of creation, God gave us a soul that will live eternally. So we image God in our eternal future. We also are a reflection of God in our capacity for reason. This sets us apart. Humans can think logically, not merely instinctually. 
That we are set, uh, we reflect God in our ability to think and to act creatively, to think abstractly, which is something the animal world can't do. We, like creatures, are rational creatures, some more rational than others, maybe, all right? But we're rational creatures. And what have we seen in Genesis 1? We've seen an intelligent God. A God who forms a plan and then carries out that plan to its fullest and perfect degree. And we share that, again, in a lesser form. It's a dim reflection, but it's, it's, it's a reflection. We have the ability to be rational, creative creatures who carry out plans and form them from our distinctly created God-imaging minds. Humans also vividly reflect God in this, that we have the capacity to make moral decisions. Right? We, we think morally. No other creation does that. No other aspect of creation does that. We can make an we can make assess we have a justice system. Like the animal kingdom doesn't have a justice system. We can make assessments of what is right and wrong. Now, of course, as fallen human beings, we do that imperfectly. Our, our justice system is broken. But we all understand the concept of virtue. You might draw those lines in vastly different places, but we, we have this idea in our heads. And where did it come from? It's because we're created in the image of a God who is the true north of morality, right? We image him in that way. We mentioned this already, that we have this image bearing in our capacity for relationship with each other. Now, I don't mean to say that animals don't have a capacity for relationship, but they don't have the same capacity for relationship with one another that we do, right? When God, in chapter 2, creates Eve for Adam, he doesn't create just a mate, but a helpmate. And the institution of marriage is created. And we can relate via covenant marriage. And not just marriage, covenant Friendships, like I think of Jonathan and David in the Bible. And many of you in this room live in covenant relationship with other people in this room because you're members of this church. And this sets us apart. This is image bearing when we relate in that way. So we have that capacity. Maybe more vividly than that, though, we are image bearers because we have the capacity for a relationship with God. That's what truly sets us apart from the rest of creation. We were created to know Him, to love Him, to joyfully obey Him and enjoy Him forever. Friends, we, we were created to be in a relationship with the one who formed us and made us in our mother's womb. So this image bearing includes that capacity for relationship. Derek Kinder comments, vis-a-vis, -vis, that's a term that just means in contrast to the animals, man is set apart by his office and still more by his nature, but his crowning glory is his relation to God. I think that's so true. This is where the idea, by the way, of the philosophical uh, argument of the God-shaped hole finds its origin. Right? Maybe you've heard this before, that we all have a hole in us and we're trying to fill it with all sorts of things, but it's a God-shaped hole. Only God will fit in that hole. Well, it finds its origin here. Friends, we are image bearers in that we were not just created with the capacity for, but the purpose of being in a relationship with our Creator. And, and nothing will fill us, really, unless we had that relationship. Now, it's a relationship that has been marred by sin and rebellion, but praise God, now it can find its restoration in Christ. And I would be remiss if I did not pause right here to speak to the person in the room who may not be a Christian or someone who might be watching this on YouTube later who's not a Christian. Dear friend, you were created for a purpose. And that main purpose is to know God, to be in relation with God. And that relationship can happen. But not of your own doing. Not of your own doing. To steal from the Apostle Paul, it is a gift of God. It is by grace alone, through Christ alone, and faith alone, for the glory of God alone. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, we're about to celebrate this, came to this earth and took on flesh so that you could be restored to your image-bearing creation relationship. He lived as a perfect man in perfect intimacy with God. And his life and his death on the cross and his resurrection restores that relationship to all who will believe. And that could be you, friend. I just want to compel you to put your faith in him today. 
So image bearing is seen in our makeup, in our structure, in our nature, but more, maybe even more to the text here. The image, you kind of got to note all those things that we said are implied in different ways in different places, but the text doesn't say a lot about like our makeup that makes us image bearing, but it says a lot about our function, doesn't it? So notice here the divine position of man. Verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over everything that moves on the earth. So two positions here, or two functions of man that are image-bearing. We have dominion over this creation, and we are to fill the earth. So let's look at those two. Dominion, first of all. He is to exercise dominion. Mankind is to act as a vice regent here on this earth of the one true king, the one God. We are to rule here on earth in his stead, in his place, like not in his place, but as his representatives. David was blown away by that when he wrote Psalm 8, which David Yang read for us this morning. He, he looks at the start, he's like, who is man that you think of him? And then he says, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet. David's like, you've crowned mankind. You put a crown on his head. And that is this dominion that God has given us. We are created as little kings on this earth to watch over this world, to tend to his creation. This is our position, dear friends. We have a job to do. We're the representation of God here on earth as those with dominion. Now, I know that dominion, we don't use that word a whole lot in our, our language, rule, authority, those words carry lots of negative connotations in our world today. We can see the origin of authority in Genesis chapter 1, can't we? And I understand why they have negative connotations in our world today. This is a fallen world where many people have God-given authority that they've abused other than used to love and serve and, 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 and do good. But that's not the origin of authority. At its very roots, uh, dominion was a reflection of the good and perfect and righteous rule of our God. And that's how we're to live, dear brothers and sisters. We are to represent the righteous rule of God in the various ways that God has given us that dominion. We are to steward the world which God has given us with the same care that He does. Uh, dominion, authority, rightly wielded. This is, this is a good line that you can listen to. Authority rightly wielded is never a curse. It's always a gift. Dominion is not tyranny. It's stewardship. Stewardship. Adam, in chapter 2, is going to be put in his first little plot on this earth, the garden, to tend it and keep it, which would trickle out to fill the whole earth, right? And he would have this, this dominion there. He would... Identify, this is Denise's favorite part of the whole story. He would identify and name the animals. She's like, why couldn't God give me that job? All right? Now, this dominion and this ruling and this stewardship is a part of our image bearing. And we are to embrace it. And we are to cultivate God's creation and all its possibilities. Now, side by side with that is this, this next thing, this blessing from God. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So, dominion and fill, rule and fill the earth. And what is this filler all about? Well, it's not too difficult to interpret, at least the first part of this. This is the pre-fall blessing that comes in the form of a command to re reproduce, to have kids. And the blessing of God is seen in the created wonder of reproduction. And we talked about this a little bit last week when we looked at uh, verse 22. The idea of fruitful multiplication was given, you know, this blessing, command was given to the animals as well. But now, God has given us the call to image what He has done even more vividly than that. What's He done? He's, we, we went over this. He's put His image bearers in the earth, and we were reflecting that image by filling the earth with more image bearers. Now, of course, the fall has really jacked this up, hasn't it? I mean, because of the fall, pregnancy is no walk in the park. Ask any mom in the room, they'll tell you, 
All right? Because of the fall, we have heartbreaking things like infertility and miscarriages. And we groan along with all of creation because of these things. Sin has broken this blessing. But we need to grasp the origin and go, in God's design, there is a call to create families. And this is a worshipful thing. It's not just a survival instinct that God made within us to perpetuate and, you know, our, our existence. And we are filling the earth not just physically, we're filling it spiritually. To fill the earth with those who bear His image is to fill the earth with His glory. That's our call. Now, I want to step out of the text for just a second and address those of you in the room who may be like, Well, that's a problem because I'm not married. I'm a single, all right? How can I image God in this way? And let me just say, maybe that's God's future for you. Probably for most of you it will be. But even if it's not, because God has called some to singleness, I don't want you to think that makes you less than human. That makes you a, a less of an image bearer because, dear friends, look at Christ, the perfect human who walked this earth. He was not a husband and he was not a father, and yet... He was the perfect image of God here on earth. So don't feel that way. But back into the text. For those of you who God blesses you with marriage. And if God so chooses in his miracle to allow this, you should have children. It's a good thing to have children. To to fill the earth with his glory. It's clear here. And we need to say this, guys. Another thing on this point, it's clear that if God has put us here as image bearers to fill the earth with other image bearers, then he would design us in such a way that we could do that. And we need to stick to that design, right? Namely, procreate, it's not that we need to stick to it, we have to stick to it, right? Even the moment we try to get outside of it, procreation requires a man and a woman. And this text explicitly states that, doesn't it? I mean, it's not get away. This is origin here. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Why did he throw that in there? What tells me that there's something significant about gender in imaging God. God has created Male and female, and we are to embrace our maleness as men and our femaleness as women. It's a significant piece of being created in the image of God, and it tells us a couple of really important things. There's implications from that point, right? First of all, it speaks to the absolute worth and value of both genders. I mean, people who say that the Bible diminishes the worth and value of women are foolish because both men and women are created in the image of God. And so there is no room in our biblical theology ever to diminish the worth or the value of someone based upon their gender. But it also reminds us that there's distinction. Value is equal. But there's distinction. And we live in a world that's trying to like throw all that distinction out. There is no distinction. Well, there is. We need to look here at the very beginning in the origin of the creation of man. We only image God when we embrace those distinctions, guys. We really do. And certainly, that's because in God's design, it is the union of a man and a woman that can have children and fill the earth with image bearers. But it, I think there's more than that. I think there's something about our maleness and there's something about our femaleness. And when we embrace that and live out the roles that God has given us, God is glorified. We're going to get to this later. Uh, but obviously these complementing distinctions build the foundation for what we believe a marriage is. Namely, it is by God's design to be between one man and one woman. We don't need to go to clobber passages to drive that point home. All we need to do is sit in Genesis 1, the very origin. We're going to see that within marriage, how we are to operate, namely varying God-giving roles within marriage. God, God has designed us with distinction. But 
Back to our point here, we have dominion and filling, procreation, and together doing these things. These are glorifying God and imaging His creative work on the planet. There's more still to be seen in verse 28. Verse 28 is what most theologians call the creation mandate or the cultural mandate. The cultural mandate essentially is this blessing of God in relationship with Him to go out and to fill the earth with culture, to submit all of our lives to God, not just the spiritual aspects to God, all of our lives. So this is not merely, and I want you to hear this, this is not merely the preservation of the world, take care of the world kind of thing, be green, that's good, right? But it's also the cultivation of the world. That's a part of what it means to subdue and to fill. We're not just filling the earth with babies. We're filling the earth with beauty. The culture is what man makes in this world. It's taking what God has made, discovering its possibilities, and creating God-glorifying things from it. So, for example, grain. God, God makes grain from the ground grow, right? What does man do with that grain? We, we harvest it. We grind it into flour. We bake bread, right? And if you've ever been in a bakery or you're privileged to have a, a wife or a mom who makes fresh bread, and when it comes out of the oven, it just the aroma of the Lord fills the air. Amen, right? just smells so good. It's filling the earth with beauty and fullness. And there's all kinds of implications wrapped up in this calling. Our jobs, for example, our vocations, uh, if we do them in submission to God, they rightly fill and subdue the world. God's doing what you do well fills the earth with the glory of God, whatever that thing is. So it may be a child who, as they're growing, doesn't know how to read, but now they can read and learn and grow and fill the earth with beauty because you taught them how to read. Or maybe it's a building that you designed or that you helped construct. If you're in construction and that building actually makes the city more beautiful. Or maybe it's working for justice in some form or fashion. And when you do that, you fill the earth with the glory of a God who is just. Your work matters. Your work matters. It's part of your image bearing. And there's so much more we could say there. Real quickly, we'll close out the chapter here. Note the divine provision for man and creation. Verses 29 and 30. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth. Everything that has breath of life, I've given every green plant for food, and it was so. Uh, we'll just quickly observe here the wonderful reality that God has provided for His image bearers. There are They, we, are to work and keep this land, but God created this world to sustain. And it's clear that, that such provision is from the Lord and no one else. He's the one who's given us what we need for our life. And did you notice here these plants and and fruit trees were given for food both for man and animals? That, I believe, is a cue in the text that reminds us that in God's creation, it, it was given for life. And at this point, death wasn't introduced into the narrative. Death doesn't come, the death of an animal doesn't come until the end of chapter 3. And that was to cover the sin of man. And it comes because of the fall. But for now, what we see is life and provision for flourishing physical and spiritual life. So let's wrap it up. My third question, if you remember, is what are the implications for being an image bearer? And we've hit some of these already, but let me, let me just close with a couple more here. Incredibly important. First of all, I hope you've caught this already. The implication is it means you're valuable to God. That may be the only thing somebody needs to hear this morning. That you're valuable to God. Because you're created in the image of God. Guys, the conclusions of a godless evolutionary view of how we came to be drains us of worth. Because in that scenario, we are nothing but a product of chance. You're just an accident. But friend, you're not an accident. 
And I want you to hear that. Some of you might feel that way. You're like, I'm an accident. I'm a mistake. You may feel that way in your family or among your friend group or on your team and your coworkers, but you're not a mistake. You are a wonderful and glorious creation of God made in His image. Now, that image is marred by sin. And we'll continue to struggle with that shame and worthlessness until we put ourselves in Christ. But friends, God made you and He loves you. And if you're a Christian, we need to dig our heels into that truth. As redeemed image bearers, I would invite you to revel in that glory. When you're feeling self-pity, self-deprecation, go here. And if you're not a Christian, we would compel you to put your faith in Jesus. Again, in his perfect righteous life, he has lived that you failed to live. And in his death on the cross, which you should have died, but he died. And in his victorious resurrection, which belongs to all who are in him, you can have a restoration of the reason you were were created. So, we're valuable to God. Also, here is the reality, and this is related to, but that's more of a view of yourself. Now let's look at our view of others. There's an implication of the dignity and worth of all people. All people. The doctrine of the imago Dei, the Latin term for image of God, it, 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 it kills the isms, right? It kills racism. All humans, black white, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're human. They were made in the image of God. And we should never look at anyone based upon their race and look down on them or think less of them. Racism is abhorrent to God because he made them in his image. And he made you in his image. He kills sexism. We've already said this, but both male and females are made in the image of God. It kills elitism. No matter if you're supremely intelligent or you're uneducated, you're created in the image of God. You're on an equal playing field when it comes to that. It doesn't matter if you're among the elites and the wealthy, the richest of the rich, or if you live in the slums and you beg for for food on the street. You're made in the image of God. God's... Genesis 1 affects how possibly we walk around the city. And we see somebody who's begging on the streets, and I think we're tempted sometimes to look at them as if they're less than human. They are not. They're made in the image of God. There's an implication of purpose here wrapped up in this doctrine. You have a purpose. Some of you are trying to find that. You're seeking for it. You're... Like, why am I here? I don't even know why I'm here. And let me tell you why you're here. You're here to know and love God and be in a relationship with Him, first and foremost. And secondly, you're here to live your life as a representation of His glory. To work as unto the Lord. To go out and create art and heal bodies and teach minds and enact justice. Guys, the reality of image bearing will affect you tomorrow morning. When you hit the alarm clock and go to work, whatever that might be for you. You go out with purpose. And finally, there's an implication for mission. Many theologians have linked the creation mandate to fill the earth with the Great Commission in Matthew 28 to, once again, fill the earth with disciples. And to fill the earth with redeemed image bearers, with the glory of God. And how do we do that, guys? We do that by way of gospel proclamation and discipleship. The beauty of the glory of God in creation can only and ultimately be found in Jesus, the second Adam. Redemption in Christ is ultimately, as one scholar put it, creation regained. There are so many applications, brothers and sisters. And I pray that the Lord has pressed into you the beauty of your origin. And it will sprout forth in joy and purpose and dignity this morning as you move out of this place and into the world. I don't know how God is calling you to respond, but I pray that you will. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you. (laughs) What is man that you are mindful of us? That you created us. That you gave us this 
mind-blowing position as image bearers of God. Dominion on this earth, fillers of this earth. God, I pray that we will listen carefully this morning. I pray, oh God, that we will not be like the man who looks in a mirror and walks away and forget, forgets what, he's look, what he looks like. But that we will hear these words, walk out of this place, this building, and that we will live, God, in accordance to the reason we were created. In relationship with you, for the glory of you, imaging you, in the way that we look at others, the way we look at ourselves, Lord. God, I know there are people in this room who struggle with self-image. It may be the way they physically look. It may be the lack of what they deem as, you know, intelligence or strength or whatever it may be. God, may this morning you heal that wound with the beautiful, wonderful, glorious truth of being created in your image. Well, there are some here who struggle not to look down on other people. I pray that we would be convicted, God. And we don't look at others with the dignity and worth of which they were created. There are many of us in this room, God, who kind of go through life not thinking we're making a difference and we don't see what you've called us to do as a way to fill this earth with beauty. Lord, would you change our minds about that? Would you help us, Lord Jesus, to have a renewed purpose and a renewed desire to go out and, Lord, image you, make beauty in this world? I pray that Prince George's County would be a better place because you put us here, Lord, please. God, I pray for the friend here today who's made in your image, God, but that image is absolutely broken and marred. That relationship is shattered because they don't know you, Jesus. Their sin has separated them from you. And you're offering them life and life to the full today. And I pray today might be the day of salvation. Would you save them? God, I love you. Be honored in this place, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.